tuned in to Elite Business Live, and we're coming to you live from a studio. I'm wearing shoes. I barely know what to do with my feet, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a strange year, but here we are. I'm Ollie Barrett, your co-host, and uh, the good news about this brilliant bunch of conversations is that they'll all be available, drip-fed out over the next few weeks and months. So Elite Business is your home, if you like, uh, for some of those hopefully very stimulating conversations. Uh, we're on our second day of two, and uh, with Hannah Previtt, we've been fielding your questions. And uh, I get to welcome a brilliant panel. It's lovely to see you all. Well, welcome back, actually, Phil. It's nice to see you. I know. You, Joe, you were one of the last human beings outside my family I think I saw last year. I know. It's been the last year. So what it's a nice lovely to see you memory. Thank you. I know. <laughs> now, Jenny's back. This is wonderful. How are you, Jenny Nyson? Very good. Lovely to see you. I, I will introduce everyone formally, but it's a bit of a reunion. If you can be Derry, how are you? Always a pleasure, sir. <laughs> We've got you down from the mountains. This is good. <laughs> We've got a fellow explorer here, Kieran. We, uh, we must remember this. And let's not forget Phil, Phil Conway. How are you, Phil? Very good, thank you. Very good. Now, Phil, I've seen your logo left, right and centre, bottom line. Your job. Where are you tuned in from today? Uh, I'm coming from sunny Reading today. <laughs> from Reading, just down the road from me. I was at Reading Station this morning. There you go. We should have a coffee okay. sometime when we're allowed. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you formally who's here. Uh, we'll go through. Why don't we start with you, Paul? You're the Director of Growth for New Business and Partnerships at Bottom Line. It seems to me you're a bit of a painkiller, actually, because you're helping businesses get paid. Give us a bit more. Yeah, uh, just simply put, um, Bottom Line uh, is very focused on helping businesses get paid uh, and be paid quickly and efficiently using technology. Um, we have various tools at our disposal. So we use um, direct debit as a way of getting paid. Uh, and we have uh, a multiple of uh, technologies that help companies uh, drive efficiency. No, good. I think it might just be the way you're sat. But when you said we've got various tools at our disposal, it was a bit lock stock there uh, for a minute, Phil. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, <laughs> so I'm sort of feeling a bit nervous for a minute. But, uh, and, and who do you do this for and where? So, they call uh, the uh, dentist. We're, no. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're a global business, but um, within the UK, uh, we help everybody from SMEs all the way up to um, uh, tier one corporates. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole collection of, of, of issues that, that uh, companies need to try and solve. Right. Um, we work hard to make sure that their payments become as automated and as painless as possible. Brilliant. And, uh, and we're going to come back to this because actually prompt payment is the bane of some companies' life. But let's whiz round, just get a quick introduction. Uh, Derry, Clewellyn Davis, you are just, well, many good things, but including you're one of the world's top performance experts. You're a speaker. I've read uh, at least one of your books. And uh, frankly, you're the name of your game when you're not adventuring is strategy, really. Yeah, Helping absolutely. people think. And this is why this panel's great, because I've been preaching for about 15 years now, cash and talent are the two top strategies. Um, and it's cash always comes first. So I think, I think we're on the right stage today. Right, good. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Kieran O'Donnell, we've met, of course, from the virtual FD. Uh, Jenny Knighting, how lovely to welcome you. And you started your own business, Nutcracker Agency, helping people tell stories, raise their profile. Was there, was there a sort of main driver to start the business? You, you clearly are so passionate about people. Yeah, I think for me it was, I looked around at the time and saw a lot of uninspiring agencies yeah. who seemed to not really get under the skin of what their clients wanted to achieve and uh. do. So I wanted to do it better. But yeah. I also wanted to align sales and marketing. I think all too often marketing thinks sales people are lazy, yeah. sales people think market people are fluffy, and the two don't really gel well. Whereas actually true commercial growth comes when the two are aligned. Right. Um, so it's a whole mix of reasons. And I also wanted to make sure that it was a 360 um, journey around a customer. So you're hitting them from all different angles. Got so it. And within the business, you're running the business. Uh, to what extent, um, obviously the buck stops with you, but to what extent are you also running the numbers yourself? Who else supports you in that? So it, I have an accountant, obviously, <laughs> you'd hope, um, and a bookkeeper, but really it stops with me. I make the decisions and I manage the yeah. cash flow. Now, well, I want to talk about those decisions as well, because there are some, you know, tensions in terms of ambition, reality, all the rest of it. Uh, Phil, welcome. You're the head of education at Capitalize. Um, but when I say education, this is all about helping accountants understand what's out there. 
Yeah, it's exactly that. So our mission is to empower accountants to help their clients yeah. have more healthy, sustainable balance sheets. Right. And that's from raising capital, but it's also from protecting their capital. It's also about recovering money that's owed to them as well, be it uh-huh. grants or from their own clients. And my job, and I, I, think, I genuinely think I've got one of the best jobs in the world, because I spend every day talking to people that are enthusiastic about helping people, right? Mm. So all I'm doing is giving them the tools and uh, everything they need at their disposal to then go out and have those conversations and actually genuinely change and impact people's lives. Um, so, you know, it's pretty cool, really. And presumably, Phil, though, a number of new items, <laughs> if I can put it like that, have appeared on the menu in the last 12 months, and we know why. Say a thing or two about that, what's now available. Yeah, but the interesting thing is things have come onto the menu, but quite a few things have come off the menu as well. So whilst, yet we've had coronavirus business interruption loan schemes, or C-bills, as it's much more affectionately known, um, but obviously that's coming to an end in but a few weeks to be uh, replaced by the recovery loan scheme. Um, But whilst obviously C-bills was a a big leverage at the beginning and then bounce back loans came about, uh, what we were starting to find was actually you started to get lenders that were retracting as well. So whilst absolutely there were lenders stepping forward to do that unsecured piece, uh, lenders in the merchant cash advance field, for example, where they're predominantly relying on card terminals, um, that wasn't the best industry to be in when most of your card terminals in terms of hospitality and retail are are, are shut down. So, yeah, it's been it's absolutely been kind of one of the most interesting years I think you could ever have in, in these kind of positions. Right. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely, and, and capitalise sort of behind the scenes, I suppose. It, it, it's educating these accountants, but then it provides them a tool. Is that how it works in practice? Yeah, so we have a software tool, yeah. uh, our platform, but ultimately that's a facilitator. Right, right, right. So it's for, there for you to put the transaction on, to put the inquiry on, yeah. but actually what we're about is the relationship. So we have a team of partnership managers that work with accountants, coach them and support them. Yeah. Team of funding specialists that work with the lenders, yeah. To, to make sure that actually what we're putting to the lenders is what they've got an appetite for. Right. So, so, so on that, let's get them. Um, I mean, um, Kieran set up quite a nice sort of spectrum, didn't he, between a planner and a doer. So your one word answer about where you sit on that spectrum. Uh, Paul, planner or doer, please? Do it. Do it, right, there you go. Derry? Do it. <laughs> Phil? I think doer as well. Oh dear, you can see the problem here. Right, Jenny? <laughs> I'm a doer. You're right, Kieran? Oh, I said earlier I'm a... Well, I'm a planner. My DNA's planning. Right, well, you're in the minority, I'm afraid. Right, so, so this is the problem, right? Well, maybe I'll set it up incorrectly. You tell me. So much uncertainty that we're going through that, that is still to come. Um, and presumably, that can put a handbrake on growth and plans. So throughout the midst of this, the reality is anyone tuning in has still got to make plans. So is there one plan? Is there many plans? How the hell are we supposed to navigate through what can seem pretty foggy? Derry, top of mind, and then Jenny, I want to hear from the driver's seat how it's been looking. Derry. Well, it's interesting. You asked the question, plan or do it. I was really hedged on that one because I I think both, right? But um, in the current world, I think doing over Trump's planning. However, strategy is planning, right, at the end of the day, if we look at it. So if you, one of the core business, I sit on a number of boards, as you know, but one of my primary businesses, where we're raising capital ourselves. Um, and by the way, we've raised millions in the last year across all the, the businesses we work with, right? And, and, but the flavor of how we've gone is very different to how we would have ever raised before. So I 100% agree with you. Mm. But currently we're in a multi-million pound cap raise on my business and I have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, and G running. And they're actually, so they're and physically they're all separate physically documents. running. And I mean, different debt, different equity plays, different, because in the current world with the uncertainty, and by the way, it was never wise to hedge on, a lot of people go, I'll go get a loan, I'll just talk to my bank and that is my only option, mm. right? That was never a smart move, uh, ever. So you should always have concurrent plans running. Yeah. But the key at the moment is, is you must do, you must act upon those plans, but, and you have to have them running. I've never had so many plans, and all of them, I've never hedged so wide. Because right. and, and, and just to scratch the surface of that, it's not just the numbers that are changing, it's different outcomes, different ways of behaving. It's the sources of the debt, in particular the debt markets are very interesting because you yeah. see bills and bounce back great, but if those are not on the table anymore, the whole primary debt markets have changed considerably. Yeah. Um, and actually there's a lot more options for debt and equity splits. And yeah. that kind of place. So things, the complexities have changed, you see, and that's why I think the agility around raising capital is key right now. Okay, so on that agility, so, so Jenny, and you must be feeling this through your clients, right? Are they spending... 
do certain things get down the priority list? But how do you make your decisions? So I think it really depends on the type of business. I think, for example, when you're talking about what Derry's talking about, yeah, I completely get that you'd need to have lots of different scenarios. Yeah. However, in some businesses, that would just mean that nothing got done. Right. So I think it depends on how big the business is, how complicated the financial setup, um, and what their core needs are. Mm. Um, if it's fairly straightforward in the sense of, you know, their p and is here, but they really need to get to there, then you can quite simply work out how many deals you need, how many customers, mm. how many leads. Like, I think it depends, but if you're getting seed investment for millions, then clearly, there's different so I don't think one size fits all it sounds it's don't let me misspeak um it sounds like you're saying if you had a to g scenarios you was like you know you know too much information so, you know, as in you could spend all day analyzing them to numbers. be honest I prefer to have a vision of where I want to get to yeah. know how I'm going to get there and then focus on it yeah no that, that, that does make sense so let's get a quick thought from Paul on this how do we navigate between these different scenarios without spending all our time gazing at spreadsheets yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, your original ask in terms of doing and planning, um, I'm facilitated to do because I have technology that allow, enables me to plan. Um, and so it takes a lot of that headache out. So look, it's going to be, it's a complex time at the moment. And I think that um, most people, um, you know, on the subject of forecasting and using technology and creating efficient ways of getting paid, nothing's going to count more than cash flow at the moment. And I think um, everybody's got to be open to, you know, even with COVID, the, the possibility of, of digitalizing their process, digitalizing their payments, um, making sure that we can create um, systems that are in place that enable us to automate what may we, we may have, of, of previously had to do is vital. And I, I think that's only going to grow. Um, so, yeah, we can do because we have to do, but you, you're enabled to do more if you have the tools and the technology that um, take out some of that um, planning and headache for you because you've got the information to hand. Right. So on this, we're, we're going to get some questions in a second. But Kieran, I just want your take because on the going through fog analogy, for, for someone that puts their foot down on the accelerator in that scenario, that could be about hope, optimism, belief. That's just another person's <clears throat> foolishness. So what's going on and what are you seeing in the companies you work with? Well, there's a famous Colin McRae analogy, which is when he was in trouble, if you put your foot in the brake, you're dead. You have to press the accelerator. And, you know, and that's him going through a forest on a, you know, a gravel track at 150 miles an hour. I hadn't expected you to now, use that. Yeah. Now, the caution is, though, especially with COVID, is that I, th I think a lot of business owners just don't have the headspace for nine plans, mm -hmm. but they just need one plan and the first six months of that plan is the most important. Mm. So, for example, a client that I've got to put in the travel space, it's on pause. The actual, the first six months of the plan is just be patient and wait. Hold your cash. Don't start chucking money on yeah. ads. You just, it's going to bring in no return. Well, again, Phil, I mean, you know, this old put your foot down through the fog. It's not on many accountants' uh, song sheets, is it? You'd be surprised. There's some very forward-thinking accountants out there that are advising their businesses that kind of thing. I remember, so I relate it back to when um, in the last recession back in 2008, I worked in asset finance. Yeah. And part of the journey we were seeing there was so many clients were doubling down on their investment. Uh -huh. They were like, actually, this is the time to double down. This is the time to kind of shore ourselves up, put ourselves in the best position to move forward, because actually when things do return to normal, we're going to have that complete jump on the industry. And those that did survived and thrived and today are still doing spectacularly well. Those that didn't aren't there anymore. Right. So actually, yeah, the putting the foot down on the, on the accelerator is a, a pretty good analogy for that, to be fair. Interesting. Yes, Ken. I think if you have, if you have you know, as Derry was saying, if you have seven plans, if your planning process is very agile, you, you can, of course you can have seven plans. But if you have seven monster plans, each one is a monster, no one's got the headspace to deal with it. Yep, so it no. should force agile planning really helps a business owner that doesn't like spreadsheets know what they need to deliver. All right, well, there you go, Derry. Your Sesame Street planning strategy has come up for a bit of flack there, so I'll give you the right to reply. <laughs> well, you know, my methodology, my book is strategy on a page. So right. that's the point. You've got is, to distill it. Um, if, you have, if you've got a billion pages and, and 62 spreadsheets, you're going to be in chaos. So uh, although we've got uh, multiple plans running concurrently, um, they're all on a page. Right? That's the key. And more importantly, they are 
uh, different plans. So in this case, there's a debt play within that, there's an equity play in that, there's a government grant play within that, there's an innovation tech play within it. So they're completely different plans and they yeah. all align nicely. And I think, uh, especially in, if you're not going for multi-million pound raises, which a lot of people don't need right now, they just need to double down, focus, do what they need to do. But if you're in the raise environment for scale, you need to be more agile and you just can't rely on one source. Yeah. Um, and I'm a massive fan of, I think one of the guys in the city called it the salami technique, right? Which is, you, if you want a couple of million quid, it doesn't need to come from one place. Mm -hmm. Get a couple of hundred grand from here, do another 400 from there, split mm -hmm. up debts, split up equity. So that's what, I, it's about that agility mm -hmm. in the raising now. Um, and, and as we all know, the, the private equity guys are starting to come back out again. And on that, on that analogy, Jenny, presumably there's a rhyme there with certain agencies being over reliant on one big client, the sort mm -hmm. of whale crisis that you might have. I don't know whether that's ever been on the mind as Nutcracker. It was, it was a problem um, where one of the founding clients who actually I got on day one of launching the business, very fortunate, um, was what, it's still our largest client. Yeah. And there was a period of time where it was too uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but I've worked really hard to dilute it so that should that client go, the business is survivable yeah but there was a period of time where i was very very conscious yeah, you were, you, there was you, an over reliance was on the dashboard yeah. right uh, so we're gonna do some quick questions quick answers and i'm gonna deliberately select and dish them out accordingly a question comes in here thank you for asking by the way um here's a slightly um uh, loaded question for you i think um, um from your capitalized perspective i reckon do you think businesses understand their financing options no they absolutely don't and, and, and more so, and this is why we partner with accountants, because they need an accountant or a North Star to actually give them that support. Because when you're looking at something on my new show on a spreadsheet, yeah. you, you miss what you actually might need to support the business. And so having someone that can lens out and look at that is super important. So, so in terms of the available toolkit, give us your top example, Phil, of the hidden gem that's available if only more businesses knew it. Do you know, I, I still think for businesses that operate in B, the B2B space, it's invoice finance. Yep. It's still got a horrific repu um, reputation back from the, the 90s of factoring and, and being a distressed product, right? But it's not. And, and modern technological invoice finance is fantastic. Yeah. And just give us the, forgive me if I'm um, teaching anyone watching to suck eggs, but give us the simple explanation to your mate in a pub invoice financing? Yeah, so it, it, it's taking an invoice and, and obtaining funding against it, be it a whole debtor book or a single invoice. Yeah, and, and that could be funding from any source? But typically, where would it be from? It, typically, so they're typically a specialist invoice finance Got provider. It. So yeah. debt, equity, uh, debt um, funding all the way. But it's, it's something that I still think, and, and we believe at Capitalise, will be key to the market moving forward uh, and moving out of where we are today. No, because. Really you know, the unsecured spaces, term loan spaces, quite flooded. What's your answer to that, Kieran? The most overlooked uh, tool, if you like, available to businesses? Oh, I don't know. I think I, think, um, I always push businesses back onto the, the actual cycle of cash flow itself. So mm -hmm. I've got mm -hmm. some clients that would be really slow to do something about it. The clients would pay us on 60 days. Yeah. And we've either pivoted the customer segment or we've pivoted how we get paid. Right. And you realise that you don't need to raise four and five hundred thousand pounds. It was on your balance sheet all along, yeah. and it's actually just you know you're self-funding your business now rather yeah. than thinking, do I take debt? Do I got take it? No, I understood. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a very it's a really important reminder. Um, Paul, I will come to you first on this, um, and the answer can't be go to bottom line. Um, so if a company <laughs> is struggling to be paid, especially by a very large corporation, give us a top practical tip because this can strangle businesses, and it often does. Yeah. Okay, that's um, we get asked that a lot actually. So that's a, that's a great that's a great one for me. Um, so think of think of the payments that are available to you. So um, uh, think of your business and your money in, um, and think of how you're collecting. Perhaps your terms and conditions. You might want to think of direct debiting because then you've got predictable forecasting. Uh, depending on what product you're selling, that can help you bring that money in, and therefore you don't get caught up in that trap because it's automatic. You could also think of uh, potentially using um, uh, collection methods at the end of your invoice so people can pay there and then. If you're going to a large um, corporation and you're a small one, uh, there are rules now uh, and there are <coughs> quite a lot of corporate governances that say that SMEs need to be paid within a certain amount of time. Find that out. Yeah, um, prompt payment I charge. Really agree. Yeah, I, I really agree with the, uh, with the previous comment that one of the panelists said. A lot of the money that you need can be found 
you've just got to improve your DSO and, and understand your business. And just get remind better, us, Paul, what do you mean by business. DSO there? So your, your, your day to day is outstanding. So uh, the money that's owed to you, um, you, you perhaps you want it in a certain amount of time and it expands. Yeah. Well, change the way either you're doing your terms and change the way people can pay you. Make Good. it easy to collect right, money. Paul, I know I'm, I've got you on your specialist subject. I know that. So thank you. Uh, and I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask for a couple of other reflections on that. Uh, Phil, very briefly. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. And, and one of the things that we've started to support accountants with is, again, with recovering. Yep. So finding that debt, uh, finding that money that's already on your balance sheet. So I, again, I think that's a, a fantastic tip. Has anyone, and I'm thinking Derry, perhaps, because you invest in a number of different businesses, Jenny, um, has anyone got a sort of softer approach in the sense that we're talking about some structural design opportunities there? But what about ones that were more about relationships, techniques you've seen work to say, look, let, let's find a way to solve this? Yeah, I think uh, my answer to the corporate, because uh, I, I had a corporate background, so the first part of my, I've got literally been split corporate was my first part and then SMEs being my second part. Um, and I think <laughs> for the SME, a lot of the times you've just got to basically strap on a pair and have the conversation you need to do. And I mean that, and in a relationship way, but you need yeah. to talk. Most people are too scared because they're over-reliant, typically, yeah. on, on a client, to have the adult conversation you need to have about payment terms. Right, good. Strap, uh, skiing analogy, I'm sure, there. Kieran, I yes? Was, I was going to make one simple point, is that every large corporate is running a payment run in the middle of the month and at the end of the mm -hmm. month. You just need to be the nice people to get your invoice in the next payment run. Have you got a practical technique? Lara Morgan told me she used to send the FD a packet of Maltesers. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe if someone sends me Maltesers, I might approve payment sooner. But, but there's always a person at the other end of the right. approval. And they are going to... I mean, if they're not paying anybody, the alarms are ringing. Interesting. So but if they're paying somebody, you just need to smooth your way in. Mm -hmm. Right. Jenny, top tip? I'm very lucky. Nutcracker doesn't have bad debt, particularly with very good paying cu customers. And I think it goes back to relationships. Um, so, yeah, we're just very fortunate in the sense that I'm very, I'm very upfront Good. and very direct. And if it even goes two days late, I call and say, you really got to pay this. that's why people pay you on time, which is exactly right. Yeah. Perfect. So I make it uncomfortable if they don't pay. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> you got me shaking up glasses for me, just to be quite honest. Right. So, this is a good question. Um, what do you think would be the best investment a small business could make during the pandemic? And that's from Roy. Uh, thank you, Roy, for that question. It's quite an open question, but what's top of mind as, as Roy asks that? Um, Derry, why don't you give me something? Um, for me, it's talent. Uh, I, am, I am picking up talent in the businesses. You know, I, I sit on about 10 different boards and I've got about four of my, my own businesses. The talent we are acquiring in the pandemic is incredible because it's available for the SME space, which has normally been sucked up by the corporate. So we are hiring uh, above grade every single time. Uh, we, we are very rigorous and talent is a big part of what I preach, what I do, right? So this is the time to bring in the talent to take you into the next decade. But, what, but, but given the potentially foggy outlook, a viewer might be thinking, well, you know, th th that feels scary, frankly, because I'm not absolutely sure I'd be able to pay their wage come September. That, that's the reality check. Yeah, I live, <laughs> you've got bigger problems if you think, if this is what I mean, I mean you've got to be clear. And the, I don't like fogginess, right? I like vision, direction, and go. And mm -hmm. if, I've got, if I've got the certainty, the whole, the whole BGI methodology is based around certainty. That's our primary, right? With certainty, let's go. Um, now, this is why you've got to raise the capital, because the capital's bringing the talent. But everyone's banging on about tech investment and all this kind of stuff, great. I'm more interested in the talent that's going to run the tech. The talent right, and, and, and without getting all philosophical, though, back to Kieran's wine tasting analogy, you're basically talking about made up certainty, aren't you? I think it's certain certainty comes in. I like to measure certainty. We measure it, right? Because it, oh. it is measurable. Um, we're always making up certainty right no one has any well this, we were sitting here this time last year ollie yeah. on a different stage and there was actually people there right yeah. um we never know uh, and i thought i i was 100 percent certain in 2008 with a very big property empire we know i never knew what was coming next right yeah. so i learned my lessons along the way that it's never certain so just be aware as long as you know that i think that's that's a, an ego deflator right it's but you've got to be as certain as you can be and then make the moves, because otherwise you'd be just paralysed. So it's, it's, it's such a big and open question, isn't it? But uh, Jenny, very briefly, then Kieran and, uh, and Phil, why not? So I think it's great what you've said, but it only works if you've got a very comprehensive commercial plan 
Because really, I think where a lot of businesses overlook is it's all very well to get investment, it's all very well to get talent in, but you've got to sell something or increase your sales. Yeah. So for me, it goes back down to your commercial strategy. So what are the best businesses investing in right now, Kieran? Well, I suppose to answer the question, the first thing that came to my mind is every business has great customers and then other customers, you're not so sure if you make any money out of them at all. So the best investment sometimes is to take an honest look at what you've actually got today mm -hmm. and try and grow the best profitable relationships you've got and then try and find a polite way to shed the stuff that just doesn't add value to your business. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Ginny, I can see you having second thoughts about that. Well, I just think that's great. You've got to replace them with someone. So it goes back down to your commercial strategy. You can only have the luxury of choosing your customers when you have more. Yeah, no, well, it's, it's, it's a fair point, Kieran. Hold that uh, thought. Paul, what do you see? You've sort of got the sort of mega dashboard of so many different businesses. What are they spending their money on? Um, technology, because uh, they want to improve their services. Um, they're making larger investments in people as well. Uh, I do concur. There is some really exceptional talent out there at the moment. And um, I, th I think now is a, is a great time. It's um, going back to what people were saying earlier on. I actually think now is the time to be brave. Um, because it, 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 you are going to set yourself up for the future. And the single biggest investment is your customers. Mm, and what does that look like in practice? We can all nod about that phrase, investing in your customers, but what, what does it mean in practice? What do you see? Do you understand them? Uh, are you talking to them? Uh, most of the problems that people have, you know, they're answered when they listen to them. So we're currently doing a, a, a big program where we're going around and talking to our customers, asking them, to complete surveys around their, their payment pains, um, what's important to them, collecting cash features quite heavily. What, what can we do to help them? What is open banking? How can I create a service that's cheaper? Uh, all of those things we can help with. Um, and we're not always aware um, until we ask. So I'd say it's a very important investment for us and it's been helpful for our customers. Yeah, really helpful. I mean, just very briefly, if I can touch on if I can touch on banks because they haven't come up in this conversation. Is there any question that businesses forget to ask their bank that they probably should? Because I'm very interested in the shifting nature of these relationships, Kieran. Um, yeah, I've got, I mean, I've got a client that's really lent on its bank for the past 15 months, and without saying who they are, they've been amazing. Ah. Like they've got a great factoring invoice financing solution. The platform's a bit clunky, but it's it's. You know, I say save the business, it's shored up a business during a real kind of difficult, you know, lockdown one, lockdown two, lockdown three. Mm. So, yeah, I've been so impressed with it. Because I guess, Jenny, for some businesses, the bank, somewhere they put the money, somewhere they get it back out. They don't play any other role, really. How about for you? That's how it is for me. Yeah, interesting. So, so miss, missing a trick? Discuss. I think if I had the, the luxury of time, I probably would shop around and find a better banking solution where I felt like I had actual input from bank but I don't have the time, right. there's no reason to, it's not broken, but am I getting the best I could get? No. Yeah. I, I have this same worry about accountants, Phil, by the way. Well, so, so I want to just go, touch on the bank point really quickly. If you're a small SME, what are you getting from your bank? Genuinely, your yeah. bank has retrenched from the high street, they've thrown you to a call centre that you can't get through to because everyone's trying to phone. What, what is that bank giving you? If you're going to do one thing now, look at that relationship and actually genuinely see what you're getting from it. Because most, unless you're a bigger business and trading in bigger numbers, the banks aren't that interested in you. And that's where people like the accountants come in because actually they're starting to replace some of that functionality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not just in terms of the money, but in terms of the support and the guidance and the advice. Yeah. Very helpful. Mm. Um, I guess, Derry, our theme here and Paul is hidden helpers. Because sometimes you look to the side and you go, you were there all along and I never asked you. Any other things we should think about on that final theme? Yeah, we should be interviewing our banks like we interview our employees or anyone else we're going to hire. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is the missing trick. I was taught it by a mentor 15 years ago um, and it served me incredibly well. I sit down to the bank and the first question I'm asking is, is how are you going to bring value to my business? Mm. Uh, uh, and that's a showstopper for the lot of the high street banks, right? Um, but that is a really important question because if I am going uh, on a journey of scale and I'm going on an exciting journey of growth, I need my bank by my side, I need my FD by my side, I need my accountant by my side, and we've all got to be on the journey together. And yeah. the bank is an important part of that. Mm. And there is not a one, all the clients uh, I advise and all my businesses, we have different banks because there is not one bank fitting all businesses and the different banks are needed for different purposes. And if you are just vanilla, just need day-to-day -day transactions, fine, the high street banks are great.
Yeah, excellent. That's, that's now, frankly what they do. Now, now let me say thank you, uh, Derry, for that. Uh, Paul, let me say thank you so much for joining us down the line. And just if I may say on a personal note, thank you to Bottom Line for your fantastic support of this event. Uh, and let's keep collaborating. So uh, thank you to you, Paul. Uh, and thank you here in the room. Let me say thank you uh, to everybody, of course, uh, to Derry. And it's welcome back to Derry. And same uh, to Phil. Great to see you, Phil, Jenny. And of course, to Kieran for that fantastic keynote. Thank you as you make your way over to see Hannah. Um, well, I would say, uh, as panels on finance go, I've got huge amounts of food for thought from that. Thinking about those hidden helpers is definitely going to change the way I start to think about banks and accountants as well. The hidden navigators, if you like, for what's available. Right, uh, onwards. We've got uh, a couple of things still to come. We've got a conversation backstage in about a minute with Hannah Previtt uh, for our brilliant panel there, which I know uh, will be very interesting. I will be earwigging away. And then our final panel of the day on overseas expansion, not to be missed. Alison Stewart Allen will be giving the keynote, and then we've got a whole range of perspectives on going global. Over to Hannah, who's waiting backstage. So many uh, useful tips and hints there from our experts on the panel. So thank you, uh, Ollie, for hosting such an interesting conversation. I know certainly at the Times and Sunday Times, something that we expect to be focused on very much over the next 12 months is how businesses are responding to this debt burden that they might now face in the wake of the pandemic and the additional uh, debt that they've had to take on to kind of ride the storm, as it were. So looking forward to delving into this and a couple of other topics with my speakers now. So Derry, if you'd like to come and join me up here. Now it's not, it's not uh, perhaps completely related to money, but I know you're an adventurer, an explorer. I would like to know what lessons that you've learned from scaling mountains and doing the Marathon de Sable, is that right? That's right, yes. Did you learn any business lessons that you were able to take and apply to you know, running your finances, for example? I think the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's the metaphor. Everyone uses mountains as metaphors, um, and, and I, I did many years ago, and now I know why. Because uh, I think, especially on altitude, when you're climbing high mountains, the air gets thinner, and there's a lot fewer people there. Uh, and there's the same in the scaling of businesses, because the statistics there, very few businesses get above one, and, and very few get above ten. And there's reasons why, because it's all the strategies change, the tactics change, the oxygen changes, and it's the same for finance and business, right? Everything changes as you go up the tree. You just got to learn to adapt. So. Mm -hmm. And is it okay, because related to that, and sometimes I interview entrepreneurs and business owners who have really small businesses, but that's okay. They actually want to stay as a micro or a small mm. business, a lifestyle business, right? Yeah. Even though they have the potential to scale, that's fine, isn't it? Not everyone wants to be, you know, the next Steve Jobs. Uh, it's one of the first questions I ask, because people come to me to scale, because I'm known for that. And my first question is, is are you sure? Um, because you don't need to. Lifestyle businesses work incredibly well for a lot of people and a lot of people aren't ready or equipped and maybe not want to do that because I think there's a reality check because taking a business to arbitrary numbers, right? But if you take a business to a million, you can actually have a really nice lifestyle business at a couple of hundred grand or a million. Uh, and you can still see your kids and you can do all the nice things and, and do th what you want with life, right? Um, because the next part of the journey is going to in involve a new skill set, a new change, a new level of stresses, a new level of um, advisors and, and different risk levels. Um, and no, you don't need to do that. Uh, if you're going to do it, a lot of uh, the people we work with are doing it for a deeper reason. If you're just scaling for the sake of scaling, that's an egoic journey and that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, if you're scaling because you've got something amazing, you're serving some great customers and you just want to serve more people, that's a little bit more of a draw and a better reason, I think. Mm -hmm. And also, not all entrepreneurs or business owners are cut out for that journey, right? Because I've certainly met founders over the past who are really good at getting to a certain point. So that might be 10 million, it might be 250 million, yeah. but then they need a, you know, perhaps a, a CEO, a kind of, um, you know, uh, somebody who's been in big businesses their whole life, a kind of corporate CEO to come in and take the helm. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, at least 80 to 90% of the companies we work with, when we're taking them on the scaling journey, the first thing we're doing is we're getting the founder out. Uh, and now when I say out, it can be out in different ways. Sounds ruthless. Um, well, <laughs> it's, it's, on the, it's for their benefit, right? Because they want to scale, because they don't actually, a lot of people want to be MD, and then they, they suddenly got the position and they really don't want it at all, right? So especially owner founders, because they're usually, they're great at the creative or the innovation or whatever comes along, right? So we're trying to get them back to a non-exec chairman role, but equally sometimes in the business at the same time, but in the function of the business that they love, 
it's usually the function they started in and it's getting them back to their roots like uh, you think Bill Gates, Bill Gates loved the technology part and, and he still does that um, but he didn't need to be CEO and I think this is certainly on our scale up journey we very rarely see a founder that can take it all the way through uh, and there's nothing wrong with that um, I don't I, I've you know I've got CEO in my businesses because I'm not the right person for that either um, but that's sometimes a few, hard for a few people to recognize yeah I think we all know entrepreneurs who haven't been very good at stacking stepping back at the appropriate time which yeah. you know can be really tricky so you mentioned there about uh, raising money for your businesses and helping others raise money just mm. a few quick tips for those who are thinking about pitching to investors about you know how to find the right investment partner and then how to pitch them i think so much around pitching the, the key is it's all back to business business model it's just got to be um it's got to be clear right so people buy very it's investors investing very simply you've got to like the person that's a kind of a, a given they've got to get the concept understand the idea and it's got to be compelling right um but then the talent behind it, it's not just if it's just you pitching, then yeah, I want to see a bigger team behind. So talent's going to be a key part of this, and the numbers are critical. So you know, it, the actual business, not, not a lot of people give so much uh, consideration to the business model itself. It's just got to be so straightforward and understandable. Like I always say, if my granny doesn't understand it, then you've got to go harder and simpler. So, uh, and you've got to be passionate about it, right? That's the key. It's bringing, everyone's thinking, structuring about pitching and stuff. Well, actually, we're still humans. I just, want to, I just want to see and tap into the passion um, and ensuring that there's real commerciality around it. And there is a lot of money available out there right now for the right players. I think everyone's just a little bit more cautious, which is understandable, um, but there is, there is a lot of investment going on. That's a nice optimistic note to end on, Derry. Thank you very much for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you. you. And now if I could invite, uh, sorry, if you right just step off to the left, perfect. Thank you. Kieran. This Hello. is your third and final time in the spotlight. Yes. You'll be pleased How to hear. You? So come on, Kieran, you talk a really good game when it comes to finances. What's the state of your own personal finances? Well, I mean, I read the wrong things a while ago, which was um, you only borrow to buy something that could go up in value. I know. So Guilty. That, I think that just leaves ha a house, maybe. But yeah, so I've kind of read, I've read some stuff that's been planted in my head, but it's inspired me to actually leave the corporate space and work with people who are, you know, looking to make something remarkable happen and then just support them in that in that space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so in terms of your own kind of personal finances what you know what things do you splurge on oh man i'm getting grilled here i don't know <laughs> it's my wife it's my wife watching um i don't know i think i, so. I think um i'm a big believer of value so i mean i've i've got this exercise that i went through with somebody recently was which was just to map out what spend on what you enjoy doing and how much you're spending on something that has no value because when someone says they're looking for £5,000 or £50,000, they might be able to find it in their own income to start with. So I'd like to think that I spend money on what brings me joy. I don't know what that is, but... <laughs> and hopefully your wife, too. Exactly. Um, so you talked to me about virtual FDs versus in-house kind of expertise. You must have to be really honest with clients about when they reach to a certain scale ideally thanks to your expertise that they need to go and hire somebody in-house or do you continue working yeah, with them? So, so the, the, the model's quite straightforward in that you can work with somebody for as long as, you know, as long as it lasts. So a, a simple business, a simple SaaS business, you know, I've got a client that has five mil turnover and it's a really easy business to work with. It, the whole nature, the people we work with, how we work, it's very straightforward. I had another client where, you know, when we got to an A round and it raised 15 mil the venture cap basically just wants to have a full-time FD in and it's it's absolutely fine so you can actually because you're working with people where there's four people in a shared office in Putney gets to a 15 mil a round where it's probably got now 200 people on its payroll you know it's great to work with them to a point but yeah it's there's a natural end point when things get just too big and I didn't want the full-time job in a way I kind of want to keep this stable of other businesses that you're working with on a recurring basis. So just quickly, how many businesses have tried to poach you to be their full-time FD? Um, well, I would say there's the, the natural courses, I would say four or five got to the scale where they said, right, we need a, we need a full-time person. But I still have a good personal relationship with those founders that, you know, back to Derry's comment, when people sometimes say, right, I've got it to this scale, I'm going to go and do the next thing in my mind, you know, we'll, 
easily catch up. Mm -hmm. And that's a great endorsement of your work, clearly. So oh, it's great. My whole space is referrals, and it's it's really refreshing with Ollie and talking to you earlier about you know we live in a world of connected people, and I think the past fifteen months, so much more of it is connections because someone out there can unblock your head, whether it's strategy, law, finance, numbers, a spreadsheet, a formula. There's always something out there, so it might not even be a full-time role. There's always the free bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kieran. Thank, Thank you, you so Lovely much for those you. reflections. Cheers. Great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Phil. Next into the hot seat. How are Hi. you doing? Good, thank you. Um, so, accountants. Uh, my dad's an accountant, so uh, much respect. Um, they're not just bean counters, are they? They can be a real kind of, you know, strategic voice in your company. No, absolutely. For many years, accountants were perceived as a necessary evil for business. I can see some frustration here. No, but it's like for many years, accountants were like someone you went to if you had to, right? Um, and businesses wouldn't go to their accountants by choice. Um, but now, because the banks have retrenched and, and people need that, that deeper, wider support, there's no one else left out there that can help them. And accountants are really starting to step up to fill that role. And technology is helping, absolutely. Some fantastic tele technology out there that, that, that's starting to take away some of the workload. But actually what that's doing is taking away the stuff that actually they don't need to spend the time on and freeing them up to then have deeper, wider and much more meaningful conversations with businesses. And that is where the real value add is because that's where you can take a business, help it grow, survive, thrive uh, and see things that they don't see. Mm -hmm. So what should people be looking for in accountants and they shouldn't just go to the first one that they see in the yellow pages right no it's funny enough just like Derry was talking about interviewing your bank manager on, on stage uh, interview your accountant right find someone that that's there for you, the, the type of business that, that you are there's some fantastic niche accountants out there we work with a great firm who, who focus specifically on SaaS businesses and startup businesses so they understand the challenge of a SaaS business they understand the challenge of a startup business and they can see where the opportunities the threats and, and potentially the weaknesses and, and everything else are so try and find an accountant that's actually right for the type of business that you are and also someone I always think I mean I think this in anything but someone you can sit in the pub and have a conversation with as well when you're allowed to go to the pub obviously but someone you can sit in the pub and have a conversation with it because I think that's important to have that rapport and that relationship with your accountant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is really, really useful practical advice. I hope our uh, viewers out there are paying close attention. Thank you very much for those insights, My Phil. My pleasure. Thank it's great you. to meet you and I love your energy. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you later. Oh, Jenny. How are you? Very well, how are you? I am very excited to be joined by you as my final <laughs> guest after this panel. So please do tell me a bit more about the agency. So what kind of clients do you work with? So we work with clients of all different shapes and sizes. The one thing that all have in common is they're really passionate about growth. Um, we would struggle to work with someone who were getting really excited about growing their business and they were just kind of like, hmm. <laughs> so they have to be really passionate about what they want to do, there needs to be a real purpose to what we're doing. So it's across sectors, it can be from tech to finance to data to um, consumer products, but they have to want to really grow, whether it's from startup to small to small to medium to medium to enterprise, there has to be that desire to grow. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like it's a real kind of cross sector. It's a real mix. It's quite a lot to get your head around, going from, you know, one thing like a real tech business one day to, you know, a beauty brand the other the next day. Yeah, I mean, people, well, myself included, we can all work across six or seven clients, you know, a lot of clients in one day in some capacity. Um, obviously, everyone owns their clients, gets in the skin of it, but I think where Nutcracker's different is that it acts as an outsourced team. So every single person that works on a client account really understands that business. And I think that means that you can be agile because you're not dipping into something you don't know about you're dipping into something that you know really really well mm -hmm. and I think that's what makes it work so how fast or how far do you want to grow and I ask you this because when I get asked as a journalist about kind of PR advice and we will come to this in a second um, they often ask me should we do it in-house or should we go to a PR agency and generally the advice I give is don't go to a really big agency be music to your ears <laughs> yeah. um, because you can get lost in the noise right so do you want to stay relatively small so that you can give that really dedicated you know kind of personalized service because that does become harder as you get bigger does it not it does and it doesn't it depends how quickly you scale so for me nutcracker has always or apart from two years has run at like 70 to 80 percent growth every year but it could have grown a lot quicker um, and the reason why i haven't is because my founding principle of nutcracker 
was to um, make businesses grow. And you can't do that if you haven't got people that care. So it does boil down to your team. And you ha it, takes, it takes time to find the right people. And then we've got them. You want to keep them, make sure they're as excited about what you're doing and what your clients are doing as you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how big do I want to grow? Um, I don't know. I haven't decided. <laughs> goes back to that planning piece. <laughs> well, I've kind of got it in my head, but I always had a dream that I would, I would, you know, found the business, I would grow it, and then I would exit. And Nutcracker's seven years old this year, and it's very stable, it's just doubled in size, it's on a big growth journey. So I think I will know when it's got to the size that I want it to get to. Uh -huh. And also we might well open offices in other countries, so, you know, there's other other plans as well exciting yeah so um so tell me a bit about what it is you do for them so you're a full service marketing agency aren't you yeah so it's got the luxury of not having to shoehorn people into a certain service just because that's all we do so it means we can really take the time to really listen to where the business is at where their pain points are who their customers are how they're currently reaching them and how they should reach them and sometimes businesses are in too much of a rush just want lead generation and actually that's a bit like having um, a mcdonald's you're going to get hungry actually you need to have a sustainable growth strategy and proper brand building and then if you have the both that's when the magic happens but too many businesses are quick to shortcut the storytelling angle of building a business brand. Mm -hmm. So let's get stuck into some of that stuff. I know we're not going to give away all of your uh, secrets for free right here, right now. <laughs> Obviously, anyone can contact you at the yeah. Nutcracker <laughs> agency. Um, but can you just give us a few hints and tips for people who are running their own businesses, who are starting out on the PR journey, they want to approach journalists, you know, where to start? Is it really around that kind of storytelling piece, finding your why, you know, that kind of thing? I think too many businesses get lost in themselves they think their story is so interesting they think what they're doing is so interesting and think everyone cares they don't and I think where businesses need to start is who are they selling to what are their interests is and, and what do they offer which is going to help them and I think they also forget that journalists go into journalism most of the content writers like Cracker were journalists um, and as you know my background is in media so for me they're forgetting that journalists go into journalism because they're passionate about writing they're not going to print that press release which is boring as hell that no one wants to read even if their commercial team are telling them to they're going to really struggle to do that so it has to have real relevance but also PR is changing no longer is it just you know building up relationships with journalists and, pr and printing articles there's digital PR it's getting your voice heard in lots of different ways but my biggest advice is don't think you're interesting make what you're saying interesting make it relevant and make it actually you know be something that people want to read rather than my businesses are this or this or this and we do this it's so boring you're so right that's such good <laughs> advice <laughs> thank you and i think particularly you know when it comes to things like technology i get pitched a lot of technology stories i'm very often uninterested yeah. in the actual tech itself it's what it's doing for people how it's making their lives easier or better that's the interesting part rather than the tech per se totally and actually when the very first blog nutcracker launched with which is still on the website until our new website if you people go to nutcrackeragency.com and go back to the very first blog um, Rebecca Hobson, who you might well know, went out to loads of journalists in her network who editors across different titles and said, what's the one piece of advice you give businesses writing a press release? And on there is about eight or nine contributions. And all of it is, it's not a press release, it's a story that is relevant to their audience. And it has to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Well, you've stolen my thunder a little bit because my, <laughs> my final question was going to be around press release, <laughs> uh, press releases and how to write the, the best press releases because, and I'm going to you know, be, be a bit of a thorn in your side here, I don't tend to read press releases or very rarely do I read press releases. But you would if it was relevant to your audience, had something in it which was newsworthy and the plug to the commercial person was something you kind of had a smile and you thought fair enough I'll give them that mm -hmm. then you would it's all about writing something which is genuinely interesting um, so for example we've got tech clients and if we're doing a press if we even if we were launching a new product for them we wouldn't launch for new products we'd launch with either yeah, yeah. research obviously creating that need to start with making it relevant or looking at the pain point within the industry and then at the end you'd have a soft plug to say luckily now <laughs> here you go but it would always be a proper well-written article mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's a big uh, kind of step on the journey, isn't it? Well, thank you, Jenny. Thank that you has Anna. been so helpful, and I'm sure our audience today will have really enjoyed listening to your insights there. I'm sure that all our clients can look forward to being covered in the Sunday Times. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hold me to that. <laughs>